Hello, I'm Daniel and I teach chemistry at the University of Glasgow. In this unit we will, we will refine our ideas about chemical equivalence and I will introduce the concept of magnetic equivalence as it relates to NMR spectroscopy. I will also show you how to think of a group of magnetically coupled nuclei as a spin system. So let's start by unpacking this term chemical equivalence. You may have heard it said that in NMR spectroscopy, chemically equivalent atoms will give a single signal. Well, that makes sense, because the chemical shift of a particular atom is determined by the environment of that atom. Atoms in the same environment will give signals in the same place in the NMR spectrum. It's also true that chemically equivalent atoms do not couple to each other. Now, there are a couple of ways in which different atoms may be in the same environment. The first thing to consider is the shape of a molecule. Atoms may be chemically equivalent if they are related by a rigorous symmetry. If a molecule has a symmetry element that interchanges two atoms, then they must experience exactly the same environment. Let's consider the main group compound, phosphorus pentafluoride. It makes a change from organic compounds, and fluorine is a monoisotopic element. All naturally occurring fluorine is fluorine-19, which has a nuclear spin of one half, just like hydrogen. And phosphorus, well, that's a monoisotopic element as well. All naturally occurring phosphorus is phosphorus-31, which also has a nuclear spin of one half, again, just like hydrogen. Because of the breadth and the significance of organic chemistry, many people view NMR spectroscopy as a tool to study carbon and hydrogen atoms. Well, fluorine and phosphorus are just as easy to study, and if they are present in your compound, perhaps their NMR spectra will be useful to you. So phosphorus pentafluoride has a trigonal bipyramidal shape. That means it has a point group symmetry of D3H, and there are a whole bunch of symmetry operations that go along with this point group. These operations leave the molecule invariant or unchanged. All we need to do is spot that there is a threefold axis labelled C3 that interchanges this group of three fluorine atoms. We'll call these three equatorial fluorine atoms. This means that by symmetry, each of these three equatorial fluorine atoms is identical and must be chemically equivalent. While a different symmetry operation, such as the mirror plane, labelled M, interchanges the pair of fluorine atoms that are aligned along the C3 axis. These two axial fluorine atoms are also in identical environments and must be chemically equivalent. There are no symmetry elements of the point group D3H that allow exchange of axial and equatorial fluorine atoms. So these two groups of atoms are distinct. So what would we predict for the 19F fluorine NMR spectrum? Well, we should get two signals. One for the two axial atoms and one somewhere else for the three equatorial atoms. And these signals should have integrated intensities of two to three, respectively. Predicting the number of signals and the relative intensities gives us the gross features of the NMR spectrum. We should remember that magnetic nuclei can couple to one another, giving some fine structure to our NMR signals. These couplings cause a splitting pattern depends upon the number of equivalent nuclei that are nearby and the value of their nuclear spin quantum number. In this case, all the atoms in phosphorus pentafluoride have a non-zero magnetic moment. We can describe the molecule by a generalised spin system. In this method, chemically equivalent atoms are given the same letter code and chemically inequivalent atoms are given different letters. We use adjacent letters of the alphabet for chemically similar atoms and letters further away for very different ones. So here we can label the three equatorial atoms with the letter A and the two axial atoms with the letter B, while the phosphorus, which is a very different sort of nuclei, is given the letter X. So now we can generalise and say that in this case we have an A3B2X spin system. Since every A 
B, and X atom has a nuclear magnetic moment of one half, it can easily predict all of the coupling patterns. In the 19F NMR spectra, we will see signals from the equatorial and the axial fluorine atoms. The signal from the equatorial A atoms will be split by the axial B atoms and by the phosphorus, the X atom. The splitting by the X atom will cause the signal to be split into a doublet. The distance between these two lines will give us the size of the AX coupling constant. Typically, a one bond fluorine to phosphorus coupling constant will have a value of about 700 Hz. But the coupling of the A atoms to the two spin one half B atoms will cause each of these lines to be split into a binomial triplet. The distance between these lines will give you the AB coupling constant. So the expected signal for A is a doublet of triplets. Also in the 19F NMR is a signal from the axial B atoms. B must couple to X and will be split by this single spin half nuclei into a doublet. And the B atoms will also couple to the three A atoms, giving a binomial quartet. So we predict a doublet of quartets. And we can extract the BX and the AB coupling constants from this signal. The coupling constants J, A, B is the same in both the A and the B signals. The AX and the BX coupling constants are expected to be very similar in value, since the bonding between the A and the X and the bonding between the B and the X atoms are very similar. The phosphorus 31 NMR spectra should comprise of a single signal from the single phosphorus atom in the compound. It is the X in our A3 B2 X spin system and it will couple both to the three A atoms and the two B atoms and so should be a triplet of quartets. And since we expect both J A X and J B X to be similar we should expect the triplet and quartet to overlap making this pattern a little bit more difficult to recognise. At this point we hit a bit of a snag. If we actually go and record the 19F NMR spectra and the 31P NMR spectra of phosphorus pentafluoride, these predictions are not what we observe. OK, don't panic. There's nothing wrong with our approach. In fact, we just need a little bit more chemical insight in order to make sense of the actual observations. There is another way in which atoms can become chemically equivalent in an NMR experiment. If there is some process that can exchange inequivalent atoms, and that process happens faster than the timescale on which the NMR spectrum is measured, in that case, we would see an average signal from atoms exchanging between inequivalent sites. So coming back to the trigonal, bipyramidal and molecular structure of phosphorus pentafluoride, there is a process that exchanges the fluorine atoms in the axial positions with the fluorine atoms in the aquarial positions. This internal dynamic molecular motion is known as fluxionality. The mechanism of exchange is known as Berry's pseudo-rotation. It is a low energy process that involves a small distortion from the trigonal bipyramidal structure to a square-based pyramidal transition state. The barrier for this process in phosphorus pentafluoride is about the same as the energy barrier for free rotation of a methyl group. So if the fluorine atoms in the different axial and equatorial sites are being rapidly exchanged, then on average each fluorine experiences the same chemical environment. Our A2B3X spin system becomes an A5X spin system, and for an A5X spin system, we would predict just one signal in the fluorine 19 NMR. And these A atoms will couple to the single X atom, the phosphorus, to give a doublet. While the NMR of the X atom, in this case the phosphorus atom, the signal will be split by the five equivalent spin one half A atoms into a binomial sextet, a six line spectrum with a one to five to 10 to 10 to five to one intensity pattern. This is what we actually observe. 
So, chemically equivalent atoms experience the same environment. And that equivalence may be due to some spatial symmetry within a molecule, or to some dynamic process that changes the environment of an atom, making chemically inequivalent atoms chemically equivalent based upon some time-averaged environment. We now need to introduce the concept of magnetic equivalence. Groups of chemically equivalent atoms may also be magnetically equivalent if they experience the same coupling interactions between these different groups. At this point, we really need to illustrate this with some examples. Let's think about the NMR of fluoromethane. Here it is. Fluoromethane has a threefold symmetry. All the hydrogen atoms are in the same chemical environment by symmetry, and that makes this an A3X spin system. Now let's think about the coupling interactions. Each A atom couples to the X, and vice versa. In this molecule, all three A to X coupling pathways are identical because of the C3V symmetry of fluoromethane. We can say that from a coupling perspective, each of the A atoms is magnetically equivalent, and we would successfully predict that the proton NMR spectra would give us a single signal that is split by the fluorine atom into a doublet, while the fluorine NMR will give us a single signal that is coupled to the chemically and magnetically equivalent hydrogen atoms, giving rise to a binomial quartet. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward. Let's take another example. If we consider the very simple organic molecule 4-fluorocyanobenzene, here it is. It's a planar, rigid molecule. Thinking about chemical equivalence of the NMR active nuclei in this C2V symmetry molecule, there are two chemically equivalent hydrogen atoms that are ortho to the fluorine atom. There are two hydrogen atoms that are meta to the fluorine atom. And there's the fluorine atom itself. These are the only nuclei that we need to worry about. We can treat all the other atoms as being NMR inactive. This is reasonable, as most carbon is carbon-12, which has no nuclear magnetic moment, and only an insignificant amount, in this case 1% of the carbon, is carbon-13, which has a nuclear spin of one half. The other atom here is nitrogen. OK, most nitrogen is nitrogen-14, and nitrogen-14 has a nuclear spin of 1. This is not NMR inactive, but it is a quadrupolar nuclear magnetic moment. I'm going to talk about the NMR of nuclei with quadrupolar moments in another video, so for the moment we can ignore it. So from a symmetry perspective, we could describe the molecule as an A2B2X spin system, and that would suggest that in the fluorine NMR, the fluorine atom would couple to the two A atoms and to the two B atoms and give us a triplet of triplets. This is what we observe. It would also suggest that in the proton MR, the signal from the A atoms would couple to the X atom and to the B atoms, and this would give us a doublet of triplets. Similarly, the signal from the B atoms would couple to the A atoms and the X atom, and this would also give us a doublet of triplets. This is not what we observe. We need to look again at the symmetry from the perspective of magnetic equivalence, or if you like, from the perspective of magnetic inequivalence. Let's think about how the X atom couples to the two A atoms. There are two pathways, and they are the same by symmetry. Adding in how the X atom couples to the two B atoms, both the pathways are identical, and so the NMR signal from the X atom should be split into a triplet of triplets, as observed. What about the A atoms? How does an A atom couple to the B atoms? Clearly, there are two different pathways. There is a three-bond coupling pathway, and there is a five-bond coupling pathway. As far as the A atoms are concerned, the B atoms are magnetically inequivalent. We will denote this by using a dash or prime notation to indicate chemically equivalent 
but magnetically inequivalent nuclei. We can make the same arguments if we consider how the A atoms are coupled to the B atom. So the correct labelling for this arrangement of NMR active nuclei in 4-fluorocyanobenzene is a A, A prime, B, B prime, X spin system. At this stage, it's good enough to realise and recognise that A, all chemically inequivalent nuclei are also magnetically inequivalent, and B, although the chemically equivalent nuclei are frequently magnetically equivalent, there are many cases where chemically equivalent nuclei are magnetically inequivalent. It is important to recognise these situations, because when we do have molecules where there is this sort of magnetic inequivalence, we do not observe the familiar binomial doublets and triplets and quartets, etc. Instead, we observe rather complex splitting patterns. In such cases, it's usually enough to describe the signal as a multiplet. I thought I'd end by sharing a spectrum that I recorded on a compound that I made many years ago during my PhD at Sheffield University. At the time, getting a proton NMR spectra was a default form of characterization, along with measuring the melting point, recording the infrared and UV spectra, and getting some form of mass spectrometry. In this case, the free ligand, 147 trithiocyclononane, had given a single singlet in the proton NMR spectra. And I remember that I had not given too much thought about the proton NMR spectra that I should expect for my compound, an organometallic coordination complex with the rhenium atom, I was very pleased to get this rather nice, if rather scary, spectrum. Recognising that there was a chemical equivalence and magnetic inequivalence, I was able to identify it as an A, A double prime, B, B prime, B double prime, C, C prime, C double prime, D, D prime, D double prime spin system. And since NMR was not the topic of my PhD, I was quite relieved to be able to simply label it as multiplet. There. I hope there was something useful for you in that video, and thanks for watching.